Hello everyone. Welcome to the Mortgage Quality and Compliance webinar. We're very excited to have you guys here today. First, we will talk about our wonderful sponsor, which is Crosscheck. Uh, Crosscheck is a nationwide consulting firm providing regulatory compliance, internal audit, fair lending, loan review, and litigation support services. Uh, Monica could not be here today um, to say hello herself, but she will be at our conference. Our conference is in just barely over a month. The Legal Issues and Regulatory Compliance Conference, it is in Orange County, December 12th and 13th. We're very excited. We have wonderful speakers. It's a great opportunity to network. This is a very tough environment. We definitely need to talk to each other. and compare notes and make sure that we're doing everything correctly. Um, so please come to the conference. We'd love to see you. So today we are focusing on the Q in our MQAC, quality. So we're very excited to have Fannie Mae here and QC Ally. Um, first, I'll talk about Bill. Bill Cleary is the Vice President of Loan Quality Management at Fannie Mae. Bill leads Fannie Mae's loan level quality control strategy and execution, including loan quality sampling strategy, governance and controls, file reviews, data validation, repurchase management and technology. His prior experience spans many areas, including servicing, capital markets, securitization and enterprise wide technology initiatives. Bill, very glad to have you. And also we have Kristen Broadley, she is the Chief Innovation Officer at QC, QC Ally. Kristen is responsible for driving transformative initiatives by identifying strategies, business opportunities, and new technologies to enhance competitiveness. Kristen previously spent 20 years in the Rocket family of companies in various roles with the bulk of her career being in risk management. And at Rocket Mortgage, she led initiatives and teams in credit risk, origination, quality monitoring, risk mitigation, fraud, anti-money laundering, and servicing risk. So two very experienced people here to help us today. Thank you so much for being here. And Bill, please take it away. Okay, great. Well, uh, I guess it's still morning for most of you. So good morning on the West Coast. I'm excited to be here with uh, Kristen and, and Paula and, and everybody from the uh, California MBA me uh, membership to really talk about uh, loan quality. Um, I will start out by covering some uh, trends that we're seeing, including defect uh, rate trends and top defects that we're seeing. I'll then shift to highlighting what's new from Fannie Mae, including details on our June selling notice around quality control calibrations uh, and our updates around the undervaluation flag that's now available in Collateral Underwriter, and our soon to be published updates to Beyond the Guide, which is really our how-to manual for establishing a robust quality control program. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, next one, please. All right, so on this graph, uh, we can see the rolling 12 month final significant defect rate from Fannie Mae post-purchase statistically valid random sample from 2005 through Q3 of last year. All right, now that's a mouthful. So this is our final, and there's a lot of data behind this. This is our final defect rate after all corrections and cures. It represents only those eligibility defects that resulted in a repurchase or a repurchase uh, alternative. Now, because it's a statistically valid random sample, we can, with a reasonable degree of confidence, extrapolate these results to the broader population, and hence, it's a good bellwether of overall loan quality over time. Now, one thing I'll note is that this is a lagging indicator. As you all know, working alone through the repurchase remediation process can take time, which is one of the reasons why we only have uh, this final data through Q3 of last year. Uh, if you're interested, you can find this information on the Fannie Mae Capital Markets website. It's on our credit risk transfer page, and you can find it by clicking on the single family credit management icon. Uh, a couple of things I'll point out on this chart. 
first you can see that over time, the overall level of loan quality has improved dramatically. Now, this is really a testament to all the effort and investment in loan quality risk management that we as an industry have made coming out of the 2009 housing crisis. Second, if you zoom in on the right-hand side of the chart, you can see a noticeable uptick in the defect rate, and that's been driven mainly by the 2021 acquisition vintage. Now, let's pause for a moment and think about what the industry was managing through uh, in 2021, right? We had continued high record origination volumes. There were a myriad of COVID-related policy changes implemented by the GSEs in 2020, 20, 2020, excuse me, that folks were still having to manage through. And uh, I know for uh, some of you, you were dealing with employee turnover due to the high demand for underwriting talent to manage that record loan volume. So much different environment than we're experiencing today, but you had record loan volumes, myriad of COVID related policy changes to manage through, uh, and for some firms dealing with attrition and turnover. So against that backdrop, it's really no surprise that we saw an uptick in loan manufacturing errors. Uh, however, what, what you don't see from the chart is a slightly higher increase in the Fannie Mae initial or gross defect rate from this same random sample. So this is the rate prior to lenders having an opportunity to remediate or correct any issues. And, and what we saw was that spread between the initial or gross defect rate and the final or net defect rate we saw that start to widen in 2021 for some lenders. Now, one question you might ask is, if lenders are doing a good job of remediating the errors found in the sample, despite that high initial gross defect rate, well, what's the problem or what's the issue? Um, and that would be a really good question. And there's a couple of things that this causes. First, it's very operationally inefficient. It creates more touches for you. It creates more touches for Fannie Mae and an increased cost better and cheaper and faster to get it right on the first go round. And I know everybody is focused on cost containment this year. Second, it creates some latent risk. And I'll explain what I mean, mean by that. So uh, if you are, a, as a lender, are doing a good job of remediating the issues within the sample, well, what about all those loans that are not in the sample? They still reflect that high gross defect rate. Now, Let's fast forward two years and assume one of those loans not in the sample goes delinquent. Maybe the economy's in a recession and that loan gets selected by Fannie Mae for a delinquent loan review. You know, are you as confident in your organization's ability to remediate an origination issue at that point? If you needed to go back to the borrower to help clear something up, here's hence, is that really likely? Uh, what if it was a complicated transaction and both the underwriter and processor who worked on the file are no longer with the organization? Would someone else be able to make heads or tails of it? Uh, the point I'm trying to make is, and I think we all know this, that the further you get away from origination, the messier it can get and the harder it can get to remediate issues. But this really underscores the importance of actively managing both your initial or gross defect rate and your net or final defect rate. It reduces costs and it mitigates future risk. Uh, if you're interested for more information on managing gross defect rates, I would, I would suggest you check out the March Quality Insider article publication on the Fannie Mae Quality, uh, on the Fannie Mae Loan Quality page. Uh, that can be found at www.fannimae.com forward slash loan quality. Or if you go into Google and just type in Fannie Mae Loan Quality, you can find it that way. Uh, that's usually what I end up doing. Uh, so, uh, we've talked about overall defect rate. On the next slide, we will dig into some of the top defects that we are seeing. There we go. Um, all right, so on this slide, we can see the top defects from our random statistical sample for loan acquisitions for the first half of 2022 versus a similar time frame for 2021. Now, looking to the first half of 2021, we saw some familiar defects in the top five, namely uh, borrower not employment closing, undisclosed liabilities, 
and self-employed income calculation errors. And you know, if we look back over the last five years, those defects would probably probably be in the top five on an annual basis. Uh, these are areas that we typically see presenting challenges uh, with respect to loan manufacturing, you know, albeit for, for different reasons. What was new to the leaderboard in 2021 compared to prior years was income documentation errors for self-employed borrowers. Now, this was in part due to the additional COVID policy documentation requirements related to self-employed borrowers. But we took an already complicated process, added additional requirements on top of it. So it's no wonder we saw some manufacturing errors increase here. Compounding the issue was the economic environment at the time. Uh, the fact that underwriting self-employed borrowers became more difficult due to COVID-related income stream disruptions and inconsistencies. Now, if we fast forward to 2022, we see a different picture start to emerge. We're still seeing some challenges with self-employed income calculation errors and continued challenges with self-employed income documentation, despite most of the temporary COVID policies expiring. However, other top defects are starting to shift to rental income, base income, and liability calculation errors. Uh, and there are, I won't, I won't go into all of them in detail, but there are a couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, an increase in base income calculation errors may be an indication of increased, increased pressure to make purchase deals work. So as risk managers and QC professionals, you know, this is one area you should be attentive to. Um, and, you know, this may be one area that you want to focus on in your targeted pre-funding QC samples and in your staff training. Uh, monthly payments not properly calculated or liability calculation errors, uh, we've seen that those are in part due to, due to calculation errors for student loans. Annie and Freddie do have slightly different policies here. And so, again, this is another area where you may want to target in your pre-funding QC. Um, liability calculation errors can also be a sign of, of stretching to make deals work, so to speak. All right, so let's shift away a little bit from loan quality trends and focus on some of the things that are new from Fannie Mae. Okay, in our June selling guide notice, we communicated that starting in Q4 of this year, we would start con conducting QC of lender QC outcomes, also known as QC calibrations. And we start doing this at a fairly regular cadence across a large portion of lenders. So in the past, we've conducted QC calibrations, but it's really been more on an informal and ad hoc basis. So what are QC calibrations? At its most basic level, a QC calibration is an independent review by Fannie Mae of a subset of loans that were delivered to Fannie Mae that you as the lender have already QC'd as part of your post-funding random QC reviews. And during this process, we will compare our QC outcomes with your QC outcomes to ensure we have alignment on defect identification and the severity of the defects being identified. All right, so what are the benefits here for this new process? Well, one benefit is most of the work is being done by Fannie Mae. Other than lenders transmitting some additional loan files for review and uh, providing some additional uh, QC data fields, the additional review work is being done by Fannie Mae. These are all subsets of uh, samples that are already part of your post-funding post QC reviews. Uh, it helps validate for you as the lender that you're accurate, accurately identifying eligibility violations. It increases reliability in your reported defect rates and self-reporting for defects. It helps provide independent benchmarking of your QC results to help you drive continuous improvement in your overall quality control program. Uh, and, and most importantly, it provides you with the knowledge and confidence that your QC program outcomes are well aligned with Fannie Mae. All right, so we've touched on uh, what QC calibrations are and what the benefits are. On the next slide, we'll go into the, the details of how the process will work. All right, so this is sort of a stylized timeline of the overall process, and I'll just walk you through it. 
So approximately 60 days prior to the calibration, Fannie Mae will notify you, the lender, uh, that you've been selected for a calibration, and we will request a loan list from you of recently completed reviews of loans delivered to Fannie Mae that were included in your post-closing random sample. We'll provide 60 days for you to deliver that loan list to us. Um, we will also require some additional QC outcome information, like whether the loan was effective or not effective. Uh, and from this list, we will select a sample of loans to review and then provide you 30 days to deliver the loan files that we have selected for review, plus some additional lender QC data. Um, so that brings us to about day 90 in the process. Once the loan files have been delivered, Fannie Mae loan reviewers will begin their independent QC of the files. They'll complete those within 30 days. Uh, those reviews are done blind to the uh, your outcomes. So the folks reviewing the files uh, don't have insight into what your outcome on the file was. Once that is completed, uh, that brings us to about day 120, Fannie Mae's QC specialist team will assess the Fannie Mae outcome versus your outcomes and provide feedback on those initial results within 30 days of the completed file review. And then after calibrating those outcomes with you, the lender, and ensuring we're in, all in alignment as to the results, Fannie Mae will issue its final calibration report. Now, if we see a large uh, gap in outcomes, we may require some additional actions to address those gaps. Uh, this process will occur annually for Fannie Mae's largest 50 lenders uh, by volume and will occur approximately once every five years or so for lenders 51 through 100. Uh, lenders may also be selected based on quality risk management performance concerns. So, for example, um, uh, uh, after a more review, one of the outcomes may be a QC calibration. Uh, now, the key takeaway here is that this will be a very well-defined, repeatable process with adequate time uh, for both uh, you, the lender, and Fannie Mae to complete the required tasks. Uh, if you want more information on QC calibrations, check out the July Quality Insider article on the Fannie Mae Loan Quality page. Again, that's www.fanniemae.com forward slash loan quality. Now, the, the announcement on QC calibration came out in June. Also in, Ju in June, we introduced some new functionality within the collateral underwriter, uh, which I will cover on our next slide. Okay, so the recently released undervaluation flag and reason code messaging in, C in collateral underwriter or CU leverages CU's database of over 50 million appraisals and its advanced analytics to provide you, the lender, with an additional tool to help identify and investigate potential misvaluation. So it works very similar to the way the existing overvaluation flag works today. When an undervaluation flag is displayed in collateral underwriter, the single reason code with the strongest statistical correlation to the undervaluation will be displayed. So this really helps you drill down to the most relevant issue. Uh, currently, this flag is for informational purposes only and will not impact the value rep and warrant relief offered via CU at this time. Uh, Fannie Mae is going to continue to monitor and learn from the undervaluation flag results. You know, we've just, we've had this uh, available in the model for less than six months. Um, so we're continuing to learn uh, and train the model on undervaluation. You know, we've been modeling overvaluation for over 10 years, right? So um, there will be some continued learning here on, on our end as well. Uh, we really recommend that uh, lenders develop their own internal standard practices for using the undervaluation flag in CU after you've had a chance to review the Fannie Mae guidance that can be found on the collateral underwriter page. Uh, there are two really helpful videos on that collateral underwriter page. One that talks about how you can utilize the overvaluation flag in your process. The other that talks about how you can utilize the undervaluation flag in your process. Um, really helpful. I really uh, 
well, you know, encourage you to go check those out. All right, so now let's look ahead to some of the things that are coming for 2023. All right, uh, Beyond the Guide, I am really excited about this one. Beyond the Guide uh, will, will be coming in Q1 2023, an updated and improved version of Beyond the Guide. We haven't updated it in a few years. Uh, beyond the Guide really goes beyond the minimum QC requirements that you find in our selling guide to provide that how-to manual for establishing a really robust quality control program. Uh, and on the next slide, I'll detail some of the, the updates you can expect. So in addition to a focus on the fundamentals of effective quality risk management, the updated Beyond the Guide will include more illustrated examples, and it'll just have a more user-friendly look and feel to it uh, compared to the old version. The, one of the benefits of Beyond the Guide is that each chapter can be taken as a standalone, or you can use it as part of a comprehensive approach to quality risk management. All right, and last but not least, I wanna make sure that I'm providing some transparency into the many great learning resources we have available for you at Fannie Mae. Um, and I, I'll detail some of those on the next slide. One of our premier educational events is our annual risk management boot camp. Now, since the pandemic, we've conducted that boot camp via a webcast series that's free to all lenders and vendors and offers convenience of viewing the replays of the topic at your leisure. Uh, and while the feedback in the webcast series has been overwhelmingly positive, the feedback's also been pretty loud and clear that. The in-person event really just provided a unique opportunity to connect and share best practices with industry peers, as well as meeting face-to-face -face, uh, with some of the, the Fannie Mae subject matter experts. So I'm super excited to announce that in-person boot camp will be returning in 2023 with a specific focus on loan quality and quality control. Uh, and we'll leverage the webcast series for other risk management topics. Another resource that I would like to highlight is the Quality Insider publication. I know I've uh, referenced that a couple times today. The topics in this publication are really very intentionally focused on areas where we see common quality risk management challenges among lenders. And the intent of these articles is to provide practicable so solutions and actionable insights to help address these issues. Uh, we'll also leverage Quality Insider from time to time to provide additional information on a new process, such as the QC calibration. I really recommend you check uh, out the Quality Insider publications. You can find all of them historically on our website, uh, as well as the webcast replays of our boot camp. And again, that is at www.fannymae.com forward slash loan quality. All right, the, that wraps up my uh, presentation portion of the webinar. And I think we're gonna shift over to uh, Kristen and I just having a discussion around low quality. Yes, thank you. Thank you um, for the presentation. There was a lot of great information. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate the California MBA uh, for the invite. And um, uh, for those you know, on, on the, the webinar, Bill and I have known each other for quite a while. We've worked together for a number of years. And so um, I'm excited to kind of get his perspective and, and talk through some of the things that we're, we're seeing, we're hearing, we're feeling um, in our industry. So um, just to like kick off some questions. Um, yeah, you talked about a few things that, you know, Fannie Mae is working for in 2023. So you've got Beyond the Guide, you've got a return to the in-person risk management boot camp, which I am thumbs up for. I loved that. Um, are there other QC changes that, that Fannie's looking at for 2023? Because um, I will tell you, hearing from our partner clients and hearing from other folks in the industry, there's, uh, and, you know, there's certainly been um, um, some articles out there. A lot of folks are talking about pre-funding changes. Yeah, so um, one thing we're uh, assessing right now, uh, Kristen, is uh, our QC requirements in the selling guide. And you know, if you really look at the, the, the selling guide QC requirements, 
In some areas, we're very, very prescriptive, um, and in other areas, not so much. So we're looking to see if we might need to be less prescriptive than we are today in some areas, and maybe offer a little more guidance in areas where we don't offer as much guidance today. Um, and so one example of that is in the uh, pre-funding QC space. Um, we, we, we have some requirements, but it's not quite as detailed as our post-funding QC requirements. Uh, so that's one area we're looking at. Uh, and as we look through the guide, uh, we are looking at this through the lens of uh, lessons learned from the loan quality challenges that we saw through the pandemic and are seeing now. Um, the other thing, you know, I want to make sure folks are, uh, are aware of is that as we roll out the and really fully implement the QC calibration process, um, you know, we'll learn throughout the year what's working well and what can you use improvement. So we may have some tweaks to that. We spent considerable, considerable time earlier this year getting feedback from lenders on that process as we were building it. And we even did a few dry ones with a couple of lenders. You know, but as we go through, you know, two lenders to doing it for 70 lenders, I'm sure we'll learn a few more things. I mean, there'll be some adjustments the, along the way. And I would really encourage everyone, uh, we want that feedback on that process. For, so for those of you that are involved in it, please don't uh, be shy to speak up and let us know, you know, what worked, what worked well and maybe some things that could use improvement as we go through the process this year. Yeah, so I have had the opportunity to go through, you know, a calibration um, process in my past. And um, uh, as a partner with Fannie Mae on those processes, I will tell you that they are immensely open to feedback, um, what works, what doesn't, um, and, um, you know, policies and opportunities and things that are identified. Um, Fannie has been very um, uh, reactive to, proactive in a lot of spaces, but reactive to, and um, it turns out to be, you know, kind of that partnership um, between you and, and, and Fannie Mae. So um, the calibration experience that I've had in the past, just for those who haven't gone through it yet, was always pretty positive. I do want to circle back a little bit um, <clears throat> uh, about the, you know, a little more prescription in the, in the pre-funding um, space. The reason being is that, um, I really feel, and, and I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts, um, kind of about the power of pre-funding. When we talk about, you know, manufactured uh, health, manufacturing quality, and all the things that um, uh, support and help, you know, grow our industry and give um, certainty, right? When you're, you're selling a loan into the market or to, or to, to Fannie Mae, um, there's power in pre-fund because it's immediate. Um, there's power in pre-fund um, because um, you have that opportunity to, you know, look at components, look at the reviews in real time. Um, post fund is, you know, is is fantastic, and it's kind of been the industry standard for a while. Um, but I always say it's a little bit, you know, it's if if something has happened, um, the accident already occurred. So it's pre fund feels like, you know, you got your tire, tires changed in the fall before the ice came, and post fund because it's a lagging indicator. It's a little bit, um, um, it doesn't actually give you that, you know, uh, opportunity to make immediate changes to your manufacturing process. Is that a little bit how Fannie's looking at it? Yeah, I really think uh, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Kristen, with the, with the um, you know, the fact that post-funding QC is, is, is very important part of an overall robust QC plan but it's, it's, it's a lagging indicator, right? Um, and by the time you get that information, um, you know, making changes on it, um, you know, it's gonna take you a while to implement and you've got kind of originations going on, you've got your pipeline that's coming through. So you're gonna continue to see those errors for a while. Whereas pre-fund, you know, you can really catch that upfront and prevent those issues. Uh, and the, you know, the other really, um, you know, benefit of pre-fund is you know, it kind of pays for itself, right? Because you're avoiding something that can later turn into a repurchase. Um, and, and in this current environment, we all know repurchases are very costly. Um, so as a way to emphasize to your leadership or management within your firms, um, 
this is where like QC can almost turn, it's always thought of as a cost center, but it can really turn into a profit center because you're avoiding things that can turn into significant losses later on. Um, so yeah, having that proactive approach, understanding where like you, your, where your organization risk appetite is, um, what are the areas that you see, you know, typically see challenges in and trying to target those in your pre-funding, having a good mix of, you know, random pre-funding and very targeted component reviews for certain issues that may be occurring. Um, it really helps capture that upfront. You know, I love your analogy. I always think of the car manufacturing analogy where, you know, you'd much rather capture, catch the issue while the car is on the manufacturing line than having to do a recall when the car is sitting in someone's driveway, right? Those recalls, uh, their repurchases in our industry are very expensive. Um, so very well, uh, you know, a very um, good return on investment in pre-funding QC. Yeah, I. Um, it's funny because, you know, historically and, and over time, and we, we've talked about this in the past, when people talk about, you know, post-funding, they're talking about self-report, you have policies around self-reporting, you're talking about repurchases. When you start talking pre-fund, you're talking about proactive quality control versus reactive. If you wanna own the risk management in your organization, pre-fund can be that, you can weaponize it. It becomes that tool um, that you can leverage to really, to your point, um, minimize costs. Um, so that said, next question that we had um, is, you know, what steps can lenders take uh, to mitigate risk from common loan manufacturing challenges. So I think there's a, there's a couple things uh, that that lenders can do. You know, we talked about uh, pre-funding, um, and that's really a great way to mitigate some of your risks and making sure you're leveraging all the information that you have available to you as a lender, not only from your own internal QC but from you know, the information your investors are, are supplying you. Um, you know, the, uh, the, what I do wanna talk a little bit about is um, you know, the process. And um, you know, one thing I think is really important is as you're seeing issues uh, as a lender is really to dig into the sort of that root cause analysis for those, those top defects or top Errors that you're seeing, um, and you know this is this is an area where we do see some challenges um, with lenders. Um, sometimes they, you know, we see uh, lenders not digging deep enough. You know, so I'll, I'll give you a, a, a recent example. Um, you know, we had one lender where we were discussing a common defect the lender was having, and they identified the root cause as human error. And you know that 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 seems reasonable. We we all run operational processes that are powered by people and people make mis mistakes. Um, and so the lender was uh, going to address that with a training plan for the staff to address those errors. Um, but you know, in, in the course of conversation with the lender um, over a few different uh, meetings, um, we continued to sort of you know, talk about the issue and dig in a little further and try and really understand what was causing those manual errors. Um, you know, why were they making the errors? Why, why didn't the underwriters understand, understand the procedures? And we just continued to ask why. And, you know, the, the lender eventually, the, their QC staff ended up going to sit with the underwriters. So really collaborating with the other business partners in the process. Um, and they uncovered that, you know, there was a process for communicating, communicating underwriting updates and changes via email and to those changes could be added to sort of the formal procedures and job aids. And, um, you know, so oftentimes the, the underwriter was looking for that email uh, and they either grabbed the wrong one or couldn't find it. Um, and so really the real issue was not having a common repositories for updates and workarounds until more formal documentation uh, could be produced. Um, and so the training wouldn't have addressed that issue Right. Um, and so by digging further, we really got to what was the, the challenge uh, for that lender. Yeah, it's um, that root cause analysis is, is really interesting. And 
in order to, and you know, you, you know, had a great example of, you know, really digging deep and asking why, 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 and getting to the place where you understand um, what happened and what broke and why. Um, in order to do that, you have to have a pretty robust relationship with your first line of defense, right? With your business partners. Um, QC is again, you know, especially in, in pre-fund and, and definitely in, in post-close if you trend it out over a period of time. It's an opportunity um, to have conversations and relationships um, and um, you know, build strong processes within the manufacturing process. You have these trends, um, you sit with the underwriters and you you kind of walk. Um, you know, through the, the front door of their process um, and identify where these defects occurs. It's, it's that um, if it's in pre-fund, it's definitely proactive, right? Because you can have them as they occur. Um, so I think that relationship uh, between you and the business, the first line is, is very important from a QC perspective. Yeah, um, very, very critical. Um, we, you know, we see, you know, the lenders that have the most robust quality risk management programs are those lenders where, um, you know, the QC function isn't really thought of as a, as a silo, right? It's for, thought of as an active part of managing the business and, and the, the, the top line leaders managing those different functions, whether it be operations, underwriting, closing, QC, um, really all work together. Um, to not only identify the root cause of the issues, right? Because there could be multiple across multiple processes, um, but then establish that action plan to to address them. And you know, and 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 once that action plan is established, another sort of key component is making sure you have you know what what are the metrics or outcomes we're expecting to see from this particular change, and are we seeing it once we implement the change? Um, you know, sometimes we see a change implemented and the numbers, you know, indicate that, oh, there's improvement, but that was related to something else, not the actual change you implemented. So it's really having that full circle coming back and saying, okay, we implemented this process change 90 days ago. Are we seeing the results we thought we would and, and making those adjustments? So having those relationships within your organization to have those conversations across all the process areas is so critical. Yeah, it 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 is a feedback loop, right? Um, I think too, there's a QC has changed a lot. So um, you know, I was I went through the the crisis of 2008 when QC really wasn't a thing. Then QC kind of became a thing that you had to do. And if you if you you know kind of reference in your head that first slide that shows the quality that existed in 08, 09, and 2010, and where we are today. Um, we are light years ahead of where we were, but I think overall, and some things I hear from you know our partners um, at QCLA is that um, you know not the the C-suite, you know the the revenue drivers, they don't necessarily see QC as that that revenue driving you know opportunity that that cost center that that you talked about, um, and I think we have an opportunity now as we continue to learn and grow, um, especially if you're engaging with your first line is really truly find those processes. Um, QC isn't always something that you just have to do. Sometimes it's things that you want to do because you want to speed certainty your, to your process. You want to speed certainty um, to your, your partners, your business partners. Um, having that, um, you know, that action planning, um, remediation, testing, validation. You're talking about governance. You're talking about monitoring in the origination space where we move out of this place where, again, QC is, is kind of lingering in the background um, and has for, for a while, um, and then uh, can step into um, a revenue driving seat, right? If you have speed to certainty um, when it comes to quality, when it comes to how you're engaging with your business partners, um, you get to a place where we're, we're kind of, you know, coming out of the wings and, um, it, uh, it's, it's kind of a good place to be. It's a very, very interesting evolution um, in, in the industry. Yeah, well, Kristen, you, you, you mentioned certainty of outcomes, and I think that's really important. You know, 
if you're confident in your loan manufacturing process um, and your overall management of loan quality risk, um, that opens up uh, opportunities, um, you know, especially in terms of serving maybe uh, markets that are underserved, um, where there might be some more inherent risk. Um, but if you're confident, you know, you can you can wade into those waters where others may not go because you know your team's going to get it right and you know your process is set up to get it right. Um, and you may not need feel like you need overlays on the, the, the GSE credit box because you know we've, we've got the right controls uh, and mitigants in place and we've got the right feedback loop if we do see an issue. Um, and so especially in this market, that can really open up some good opportunities. Um, you know, I think of some of the special purpose uh, credit programs that are out there that are becoming kind of popular now. And I really think that having a robust loan manufacturing process really helps support those type of businesses. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and that kind of leads um, to my next question a little bit. So, um, you know, Fannie Mae has, has strong efforts into, um, you know, and, and, and a mission around equitable, sustainable access to home ownership. Like, how do you see your role, your group, quality control, overarchingly um, within Fannie Mae? How does that help drive um, those initiatives? Um, well, you know, when I think about um, Fannie Mae's, you know, mission to facilitate equitable and sustainable access to home ownership. Um, and I think about how that relates to our commitment to robust loan quality. Um, I think about two things. And the first relates to the sustainable portion of home ownership, right? Strong loan manufacturing quality directly supports sustainable home ownership. If you're a customer focused organ organization, you should care about loan quality. It's so important to set that homeowner up for success from the get-go, you know, an income calculation error that results in a higher DTI for that homeowner may put them in an untenable position in the long run. Um, similarly, when I think about appraisal quality, an appraisal error may leave the homeowner with less equity to weather future storms than they might otherwise thought they had. And I think if there's anything we've learned from the various economic crises, natural disasters, pandemics, et cetera, over the last 15 years, it's that having sufficient equity gives homeowners more options when a crisis hits. So getting credit and collateral quality right, you know, matters for our collective customers, the homeowner. So that's that's one way I think about it uh, from how it aligns with, you know, what Fannie Mae's trying to do from a strategic standpoint. The other, one, the other item uh, relates to Fannie Mae's uh, safety and soundness. Uh, robust loan manufacturing quality um, really supports our safety and soundness as a financial institution. And, and that's sort of our table stakes, right? Being a safe, sound, resilient financial institution allows us to do all the mission activities. Um, so having confidence to know that the loan profile we delivered matches the loan profile we priced and purchased is fundamental to having that confidence in our, our loan performance. Um, and we can't deliver on our mission to facilitate uh, equitable and sustainable access to home ownership if we don't have that. And I think that applies to most financial institutions, right? You, you know, safety and soundness is, is table stakes in order to be able to serve your customer. Yeah, I, um, I agree. And I think every lender um, today um, anyone who's originating, you know, um, today is thinking about safety and soundness. We certainly, you know, um, we want to keep, you know, Fannie Mae safety and sound, but, you know, there's a lot of, of um, uh, reflection and, um, you know, cost analysis and, and things that are happening with our space, given what's happening in the market, the contraction of the market. Um, so where, you know, it's, um, we appreciate that we're, you know, originating loans that, that help keep uh, Fannie Mae safe and, and sound. Um, we certainly want to make sure as, you know, you look at, you know, clients who maybe have challenges in DTI or FICO or other things, um, you know, that historically are maybe, you know, audited a little harder or sampled a little more or, um, 
you know, we want to make sure that we're keeping our lending institutions safe and sound, keeping ourselves safe and sound. And um, that pre-fund, I'm, you know, going to go back to pre-fund. I'm telling you, call our pre-fund bill. I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking about it because it's, it's true. Um, we want to be safe and sound, but we also want to optimize where we are in the market. If we have the opportunity um, to think a little more aggressively about the, the credit box that we're operating in, right? Um, and um, we are able to um, originate loans with certainty as to the quality, um, we can help in that mission of um, sustainable and, and, and access um, uh, for you know, home ownership. Um, it creates market opportunity. And in cases where you know you have a, a, you know an organization that has a clear line of sight into what the risk tolerances are, um, who has created you know um, um, you know best uh, you know QC processes, who understands and, and can communicate and and um, can talk about you know what their risk tolerances are and how they're managing to it, um, it's market opportunity for those folks. There's competitive advantage there. You have certainty in um, your manufacturing health and the quality that you're originating and you're selling into the market. Um, it can be a game changer when it comes down to um, how you're able to um, lever what's available um, and you know what clients are available in a in a in a in a market that's contracted. And also, too, and I think you can probably speak to this a little bit. I certainly can. Client experience, right? If you have certainty. Um, into um, your process, if you have certainty, if you have governance and monitoring in place, um, if you have uh, certainty into you know the the quality of your of your manufacturing process, you are going to spend less time touching that loan over the course of time. You can streamline your process because you know you're getting it right the first time, or you know that you're going to catch it. So I think um, from a client experience perspective. Who knew quality control was a big component of it? It is. It really, really is. And then also, you know, again, we're in a place of scarcity. We're in a little bit of a little bit of scarcity here. There's there's resource efficiency. How are you leveraging your resources? Um, if your client experience is increased because you have less less touches on your loan, um, you're spending less time checking the checker. Um, now you have resource efficiency because you've created some of those processes that let you know. Um, consistently about the health of your manufacturing process. What is the quality of the loan that you're originating at any given time? Yeah, I, I, I think this is, you know, I spoke about the safety and soundness of Fannie Mae, um, but really, I, I really think this is an area where, you know, the Fannie Mae's interests are aligned with the industry's interest, right? Um, the you know, we want uh, lenders to be um, managing their costs effectively. We want lenders to be profitable, right? Um, and having efficient and robust loan manufacturing helps support that. You know, Kristen, you pointed it out. I mentioned it previously. Like, that's one of the reasons why we're we're focused on like the gross defect rate and the net defect rate because when you have a lot of errors up front. Um, to your point, you know, you, that means multiple touches to that fi file, um, you know, two, three, four touches um, that mm -hmm. you wouldn't have otherwise had if you'd gotten it right uh, the first time around. And having that, um, I, I love the, the phrase you're using, the power of pre-fund, right? Applying those resources str strategically into your pre-fund process, right? And where is where where is the risk in your process um, and that might that might for multi-channel lenders that might differ by channel um, for different channels and and it's definitely different and so really understanding that and where your risks are as an organization helps you be more more efficient um, and it, ultimately it's helping uh, you know the the customer um, which is the homeowner which again I, I think we're all aligned there on you know serving serving homeowners. Um, so I really think this is one area where, you know, Fannie Mae's interests and the industry's interests and the consumer's interests are, are completely aligned. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think, um, yeah, we are, we are all working together toward a common cause 
it is just a matter of determining, you know, um, what's what's the the next best step for our individual organizations, and how we want to leverage some of these these um, these processes um, and the and, and you know take opportunity where we can. You know, what can we deploy so that we you know can continue to um, uh, do well in this space? Maybe expand um, our credit box by getting to that that place or that that speed to certainty that happens. With the power prefund, I'm going to keep saying it because I really, really, I'm, I'm definitely passionate about it. Now, well, I'll, I'll, go I'll ahead. make another plug for our uh, Quality Insider publication, our most recent issue, um, the October issue, um, is all about prefunding QC. So, um, another reason to go check out that that publication. Fantastic, absolutely, plug away. And then a little bit of a shift. Um, because you know we talk about we talk we've been talking a lot about um, like proactive um, loan quality um, processes um, you know the power of prefund expanding the credit box other things um, you know when you deploy some of these these different tactics right the post moving from the post to the you know the things that we which we have to do to doing the the, the pre which is you know what we can choose to do um, but. You know we're we're in a market again. It's contracting a little bit, but one of the things that has you know come up in a few publications and you know is is probably a little bit of the elephant in the room um, repurchases. So from 2021 to 2022, you know, do you have any comments or thoughts on um, repurchases and and things that are kind of out in the industry? Sure, um, that, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I've actually had this a lot, so. Uh, <laughs> I would have been surprised if you didn't touch on it. The, you know, there's been um, uh, a, a speculation in some trade publications and blogs that, you know, uh, the GSEs or Fannie Mae is scouring its pandemic era book for risk to put back to lenders. Um, and this, this just is simply not supported by the facts. Um, what we saw in uh, 2022 in terms of uh, the volume of repurchases issued, it was prom predominantly a function of the record origination volume from 2020 and 2021, sort of finally making its way all the, all the way through the system. Uh, if you look at our Q3 earnings, which were released earlier this week, I think it was Tuesday, um, you'll see that year over year, repurchases as a percentage of acquisition um, has been fairly stable, uh, so increasing by a mere four hundredths of a percentage point. So the increase in repurchases this year is really a function of the loan volume from the previous year. Um, and you know, I think what you'll see next year is that the repurchases next year will reflect the loan volume that we're seeing this year. Um, so, uh, but you know, folks can go look at that in our. Uh, earnings release is publicly available information, um, and so um, it's important that we get sort of the, you know, separate the facts from separate the myth from the facts. Yeah, and I think um, because you know where Fannie's QC happens, um, if you're overwhelmed with volume, depending upon the time frame it takes, you know, um, for those selections and those reviews to get done, there's a lag that occurs, and it's just um, more obvious and, and painful now, especially as you know, um, we don't have those similar volumes that we did um, that you're sampling for and finding defects on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we're definitely, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, our post funding, uh, you know, uh, defect rate is a lagging indicator of what's going on in the industry. Um, even our random sample, which we do fairly close to uh, acquisition, you know, we select those the month after they're delivered to us. But it is a process, right? It takes lenders time to deliver us the files. We need to review them, consolidate the information. So it's it's three to four months after delivery, which you know. So for most lenders, that's going to be what you know. That could be anywhere from 30 to 60 days after uh, you know the loan's closed, which you know backed it up to when the you know, application and underwriting process happens. You know, it is a lengthy process. Uh, so it's definitely you know takes some time. Or you know we're and to get all the way through that and then through the you know any repurchases being issued 
Thank you. And then one last topic, uh, appraisal, um, the appraisal bias process, excuse me, appraisal bias specifically. That's another hot topic um, in the industry right now. What are your thoughts there? Like, What is Fannie Mae doing um, uh, in order to mitigate any type of, of unfair appraisal biases? Yeah, so this has been in the press a lot. I know that, you know, there's been some uh, newspaper articles about, you know, lawsuits being brought against lenders. Um, it's, you know, um, some of the mainstream media has caught up on it. It's also been in, you know, sort of the, the, the trade publications. Um, and and you know, the approach Fannie Mae is taking is really um, a multi-pronged approach to help reduce the risk of bias in the appraisal process. So um, we we currently use tech canning school tools to identify uh, the use of prohibited language in appraisals. So this includes reference to subjective terminology such as uh, good neighborhood or pride of ownership or desirable locations, as well as sort of overt references to race, ethnicity, or religion. Um, and uh, while use of prohibited language does not necessarily indicate bias in the valuation outcome, it's a clear viol violation of Fannie Mae's selling guide. Um, so that, that's one thing we scan for. Um, if we see a pattern there, um, we do send letters to appraisers to you know, educate them and say, hey, you're using this language um, that you shouldn't really be using, it's subjective. Uh, you should just be sticking to uh, the facts. Um, we're also expanding our efforts to increase part participation of a more diverse workforce in uh, the appraiser profession through mm -hmm. the Appraiser Diversity Initiative. Uh, some of you may have heard of this. This is sponsored by the Appraisal Institute, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Urban League uh, in order to provide financial support and mentorship for diverse aspiring appraisers looking to join the appraisal profession. So to date, we've awarded over 300 scholarships through this program. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing we're really doing is a, a lot of research on this topic. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to, again, let's separate the, you know, whatever um, uh, myths might be out there and, you know, from, from the facts and really focus on the facts. So we're researching the frequency and severity of appraisal bias and sharing those results, results of that research with the industry through publications of like briefings and academic papers and white papers. Um, you know, for more, if folks are interested in more details on that, I would point you to Appraising the Appraisal. It's a research paper that we published earlier this year and that can be found on Fannie Mae's website. Um, and then the, the undervaluation risk flag in CU, which we talked about er earlier, um, certainly gives lenders an additional tool to help identify and investigate appraisals that have a risk of undervaluation. Um, and, you know, we'll be able to support uh, additional research into the top topic of appraisal bias um, through the use of that new flag in CU to help drive some practical solutions. And again, there it's 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 looking at the data. You know, undervaluation does not uh, necessarily equal bias. Um, so you got to pair that up with a lot of other data and, and trends that that you would see in the data. Well, it's good that you you know um, that's information that we're turning through data. You're supportive of a more diverse workforce. So I know we have a lot of work to do just overarchingly in the industry, and um, um, it's glad that it's it's top of mind and that people are actually taking action in order to to address it. I think we only have a minute left. I don't know if Paula, Samantha, um, Bill, if you have any final thoughts. This was fun. I love you know I'm 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 a, I'm a QC person, um, so you know just give me an opportunity to talk about QC again, and I'm there. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, everybody who's uh, on the call today. Uh, this has been great, great for me. I could talk about uh, QC forever. Um, so I thank the California MBA and the membership yes. uh, for the ability to uh, be here today. Yes, and thanks to all the attendees that came to, to listen to us talk about QC. Yeah, thank you so much. We're so glad to have you on and to make sure we cover our Q of MQAC. So thank you. We really appreciate it from Sam and Mike and, uh, and I. Thank you again, everybody. Great job. Everyone, thank you so much.
Thank you.